Good morning. Welcome to Middletown Baptist Church's live stream here this morning. We're so glad that you're here joining us and we want to welcome back all of our faithful watchers and also if this is your first time viewing with us, we want to welcome you today as well. And if this is your first time watching um, our live stream, we ask that you go to our website, middletownbaptistchurch.org and send us a message. Let us know that this is your first time and so that we can reach out to you and uh, let you know a little bit more about our church. And of course, you can find more information about our church on our Facebook page or on our website at middletownbaptistchurch.org. Well, I hope you've been having a great week. I hope that the Lord is continuing to bless you. I know that we're getting a little bit restless, and I know that um, the folks here in Delaware are ready for a lot of things to start happening. And um, you know, with this virus going on, we don't know exactly all the answers, but we know who does have all the answers, and that's our Savior, Jesus Christ. And here in this service today, that's what we're going to be focusing on. We're going to be focusing on the power of God. We're going to be focusing on how great our God is to us and the love that he has for us. And in a world in which we can put our minds and our focus on a lot of negative things, obviously, um, I want us today uh, during this time and really throughout our lives uh, to focus on those blessings that God has given us. Uh, when the perspective is on the things that matter, when the perspective is on the things that are eternal, um, obviously we can have more appreciation for who our Savior is and we can have more appreciation and thankfulness and gratitude for what God has done for us in our lives. And the greatest thing that God has done for us is extending His gift of salvation. And so most of you that are watching this video today, um, whether it be live or whether it be on the recording later, um, understand what that great gift of salvation is. But if you don't know what that gift of salvation is, I pray that through this service, you will see, um, and, the, and the Holy Spirit will convict you to see exactly what it means to have true faith in Jesus Christ and have everlasting life in Him. And so really, our goal here today is to worship our Savior, um, to exalt His name, and then for us to grow in our faith and grow in our knowledge of Him, and then ultimately to present that gospel message, that good news message. And so I encourage you, as you sign on here today, uh, to comment, to greet each other, uh, to say hello, uh, maybe even to give a testimony of what the Lord has done for you, or possibly a brief testimony of your salvation experience. And uh, that would be a blessing for a lot of people to see on the comment section. So let's continue to uh, write on the comment section, and don't uh, necessarily get so distracted with the comment section that you forget about the worship service. But let's have a good balance here this morning of fellowship as well as worship for our Savior. So we're going to go ahead and open up our service here with a word of prayer. And as we do that, I want you to unite your hearts together with me. And then after we're done praying and uh, thanking the Lord for what He's going to do in this service, we're going to have a time of song. We're going to have a time of uh, worship music. And um, there's going to be a few different folks that are on the screen. I know that it's going to be a blessing for you. And um, most importantly, that we're singing these songs to praise our Savior, not to praise ourselves or to uh, make sure that we are showing off our great vocal range, but just simply to praise our Savior. And so I want you to think about that and think about the words of these songs uh, that we're going to be singing. We're going to have some announcements a little bit later on in the service um, towards the end, so I don't want to lose you. But at the end of the service, we're going to give you some announcements about how we're moving forward and some plans that we have coming uh, here in the near future. And we want you to stay tuned for all of those uh, after the sermon here this morning. Let's go ahead and unite our hearts together in prayer. And we will continue on here with our worship service this morning. Lord, we do thank you for this time that you've given us to come here at the beginning of our week, Lord, and have this opportunity to worship you, Lord. Help us not to just limit ourselves to our worship just for Sunday mornings. Lord, help us to live lives full of worship. Lord, we know that this is our corporate worship time, and I pray that we can um, see the importance of that. Lord, I pray that we can eventually hear very, very soon get back to worshiping here in person together as a family, Lord. But we know that um, there are a lot of things going on and we want to be respectful to, um, to what uh, the rules are and different things like that, Lord. But we know that you have a plan and we put everything into your sovereign hands and we know that you are guiding us and directing us and we pray that we can see um, the path that you'd have us take. Lord, we know that this is, a, this is a tough time for a lot of folks, Lord, but we thank you for the opportunity to have these a technological advances in which we can still come together in a, in a limited way through the, um, 
through Facebook and through the different live streams. Lord, we're just so thankful for that. We're thankful for all the folks that have stayed faithful in this time to their faith. Lord, we're thankful for uh, the fellowship that we've been able to see, the, the preaching, Lord, the, the music, and all the folks that have been doing their best to continue to serve you. Lord, I pray that during this service today, that our hearts are stirred, Lord, that we can learn something about you, that we can apply a truth about you. Lord, I pray that if there's someone here today that doesn't know the true gospel message, they don't understand the hope of Jesus Christ, Lord, I pray that their eyes can be open and today can be that day of salvation. Lord, I pray that all of us can leave this service today edified, Lord, growing closer to you and growing closer to others and growing in our faith and understanding of who you are. And so, Lord, we thank you for what you're going to do, what you have done for us. We're thankful for the mercies that are new each and every day. We're thankful that we were able to wake up this morning um, and, and breathe and worship you. And I pray that through this service, we can gain a greater appreciation of the blessings in our life. So I pray that you um, bless this service. Lord, I pray that you be with those folks that are watching. And I pray that we can uh, learn how to love you more through this service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Join us. Uh, in song here this morning. Feel my deepest woe when he 
Sweet sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. Everyone. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, try and true. With thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary.
Thank you. Well, thank you so much for those songs. I hope those songs are a blessing to you, and I hope you listen to those words. And not only listen to those words, but meditated upon um, what those words really mean. So many times we sing songs in church, and they just become repetitive. They just become empty. And, of course, we don't want that to happen. We want um, what we say to the Lord to be um, substantive. We want what we say to the Lord to be meaningful and from our hearts. And really, what we do and what we say is how we worship the Lord. Um, how we live our lives is how we worship the Lord. A lot of people think that you can only worship the Lord through um, song, and that's certainly a very good way to worship the Lord. But we know that God's Word tells us, by the way that we live our lives, is how we can worship the Lord. By the way that we respond to others, by the way that we um, preach that gospel message, how we parent, how we um, are, are married, uh, everything that we do, every aspect of our life, can be that witnessing tool and also that worshiping uh, tool uh, to, to praise the Lord. And our God is worthy of praise. If anything in this world is worthy of praise, um, obviously we think that, well, like maybe money or maybe a good job or maybe something like that. And we say, man, I'm going to, I'm going to praise that. But, but nothing in this world, when you compare it to the glory of our savior, uh, is in comparison. And so we should direct our worship and our praise to our savior. That's not the message here this morning, but kind of how my heart stirred as I was listening to those songs here uh, today and praising the Lord. Well, I'm glad that you've joined us. If, if you're just uh, tuning in, if you're just starting to view our sermon series, we are in our five, we're in our fifth part of our sermon series, Overcoming Obstacles. And so if you haven't caught um, all of the sermons, that's fine. Um, we're going to pick you up to where we were. And um, obviously the sermon can stand alone in the truths that it brings here this morning. If you have your Bibles or if you have a tablet or a computer that you can bring up the Bible on, I encourage you to do that. We're in Acts chapter 14. We're going to be finishing up the last portion of Acts chapter 14 here this morning. We're going to start in verse number 21 in Acts chapter 14. And in this sermon series, Overcoming Obstacles, we've learned a lot of things. Um, obviously, what we've learned so far is that God has a call for our lives. Obviously, he wants all to come to know him, to come to have that relationship with him, to have that salvation, that eternal life. But as the story goes, is that when we get saved, many times people think, well, the, that's the end. I got my ticket to heaven. I'm good. And obviously, we learn from Scripture that when we are saved, that's the beginning of the story. And now God has a call for our lives. The greatest call for our life is to preach that gospel message. Now, you might not be behind a pulpit, you might not be in the ministry, but we all, through the way that we live our life, we all, through the way that we interact with others, can preach a gospel message. And so we have that thing which we call in the Bible the Great Commission. What is that? That's to go, not just in our own neighborhood, but all over the world, uh, preaching the gospel, uh, teaching others about who Jesus is and what he's done for us. And then as we do that, when folks believe in him, we are then called to, to baptize them and to teach them and to um, disciple them. That's a term that you might hear a lot in churches, is discipleship. And so today we're going to talk a little bit more about that, but that's the call that we all have in our lives. Now, each and every one of us have a specific call in how we do that. Some are called to be pastors, some are called to work um, in different fields, but we are all called to a certain aspect in our lives to follow out through um, this, this uh, avenue for the Great Commission. So we've learned that. We've learned that when we are given a call in our lives, um, God opens that door. We don't open that door for ourselves. God opens that door. And as God opens that door and we are willing to follow along with that, um, we then are directed by him. So he directs our path. We don't direct our own um, life. Sometimes we try to direct our own lives, but in the proper perspective of scripture, we're to allow God to direct our lives. But as God directs our lives, we are going to find ourselves in times where we're going to face opposition. We're going to face trials. We're going to have obstacles. And a lot of people believe that these trials or obstacles are um, reasons or justifications to stop doing what God has called them to do. But as we've learned through studying Paul and, and his first missionary journey, we've realized that just because that there is a roadblock, just because there is an obstacle, doesn't mean that we're to quit. It means that we are to trust in God to overcome um, those obstacles in our life. So it's an opportunity to trust in God, not an obstacle necessarily. So we've seen Paul do this. We followed along here in his first missionary journey. And to catch you up just briefly, he left out of Antioch of Syria. 
He crosses uh, the water. He goes to Cyprus. He ministers there. He has some opposition there um, by this guy named Bar Jesus, a sorcerer. And even though that there's opposition, he comes to see a lot of people saved. And not only does um, Paul, uh, but Barnabas is also with him preaching. And so Paul and Barnabas see these great things happening. They see um, Sergius Paulus, a very high individual in the um, Roman government, get saved. And then they head up north to the Asia Minor region. They go through a lot of cities. They face persecution. They face people uh, chasing them out of cities. They face people um, coming against them verbally. And then eventually they face people attacking them. And Paul gets stoned. And that's where we left off last week. Um, we see there in verse number 19, and it said, And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium. So these are people that he had already uh, went and preached to. He had visited them, and they're basically following him. And so the problem followed Paul into this new city. And so they came, and they stirred up a bunch of people, and they persuaded the people, and they persuaded the people to stone Paul. And so Paul is stoned, and obviously it wasn't just, uh, a stoning back then wasn't just a way to like scare people. Stoning was there to kill somebody. So they left Paul for dead. Obviously God intervened. It wasn't Paul's time. And so um, we see Paul miraculously healed. We see the disciples standing around him. Um, when I say disciples, these are the people that trusted in Jesus in the city of Lystra. And then he gets up, he goes back into the city, and then he departs to Derby. And so he's going to continue his missionary journey. And actually, this is the tail end of Paul's missionary journey. So we're, we're catching up to all of this uh, here today. So what does this mean? This means that at the end of this chapter, chapter 14, it summarizes this first missionary journey. And I think there are some truths that we can learn here today about the end of Paul's first missionary journey. So let's catch it here in verse number 21. Verse number 20 tells us that he gets up, God heals him, and he comes into the city. And then the next day he departs and he continues to preach. And we're going to see what he does here at the end of chapter 14. And we're going to see some things that we can learn from his life here today. Verse number 21. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned unto Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. So what's important to see here is that Paul, even in the face of getting stoned, he goes and continues to preach the gospel. The very thing that was causing people to hate him, the very thing that was causing people to attack him, he continued to do it. And not only did he continue to do it, but he actually went back to the cities that were persecuting him. And there's importance to that. We're going to talk about that here in a few moments. So he basically backtracks through the cities that he had already preached to and discipled. Verse 22. This is what he did. Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith. That, and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. So he preaches this message of saying, basically, you're going to face tribulation in your Christian walk. Verse 23, And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord, on whom they believed. And after they had passed through uh, Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia. And when they were preached the word in Perga, they went down into Italia. And thence sailed to Antioch, so they're going all the way back to the original city that they went to, Antioch of Syria. And thence they sailed to Syria, from whence they had um, been recommended to the grace of God for the work which they had fulfilled. And when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them, and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. And there they abode long time with the disciples. So here this morning, after we're done praying, I want us to jump into the main points of what I think we can learn through, through this tail end of Paul's first missionary journey. Let's go ahead and pray and ask the Lord's blessing upon the preaching of his word here this morning. Well, we're just so thankful for what you've done for us. We're thankful for this service already. We're thankful for the blessings that we've seen through the folks singing, Lord. And we're thankful for the Tates and, and for the Rats and Mazafis and all that they do through the music and all the other individuals that are helping out in this service today. Lord, we're thankful for the opportunity to worship you. Lord, I pray that as we look into your word today that we are encouraged where we need to be encouraged, convicted where we need to be convicted. Lord, I pray that we can be informed about um, the life of Paul, not so that we can just have more knowledge, but so that we can see the example of this great saint, Lord. And I pray that we can see exactly how we can follow in the obstacles that we have in our life. Because if we're honest with ourselves, we know that, Lord, you, you, you allow things to happen to us. We don't always know why, but we know that you can give us the power to overcome. So I pray that you give us clarity and understanding. I pray that there's someone here today who doesn't know you as their personal Savior, or they don't even know what that means. 
I pray that they can truly trust in you today as the gospel will be uh, presented here through this sermon, Lord. And so we thank you for all of this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as Paul and Barnabas decide to head back to the city that they left from, the original city of Antioch, Assyria, they um, pass through the cities that they had visited before. Now, why did they do this? You know, if we were looking at logic, we would say they, they shouldn't really go back through the cities that they had preached. Why? Because these people were chasing them out. These people were against them. Not everybody. Now, of course, there were some people that were saved, but usually we tend as human beings to focus on the negatives. So if it was me, I would have said, man, yeah, I know that there was a lot of people saved in these cities, but those other people were trying to kill me. Those other people were chasing me out. So they had the opportunity to go a different direction, but instead they went back. They, they backtracked through these cities. Now, why did they do that? Uh, why did they do that? Well, they did that to strengthen and to encourage the Christians in those cities. There was a lot of baby Christians in those cities. There was a lot of people who had just trusted the Lord as their Savior, and the gospel was new to them. And we see that as they were trusting in the Lord, there's going to be obstacles. And all of us understand that a new Christian, a babe in Christ, will have a lot of obstacles because they are, they are prey for a lot of different people. And so what Paul and Barnabas do is they say, well, as we head back to our original city, we want to stop and we want to encourage these individuals and we want to strengthen these individuals in their faith. Paul and Barnabas wanted to do um, far more than just get conversions. They had a passion for making disciples. And I want us to think about that here this morning because that is so important. For many years, churches have been looking for converts. And praise the Lord, I'm glad that we do. Because that is part of the gospel message. That is part of the Great Commission. We want to see souls saved. We want to see people um, asking the Lord uh, to, to be that Savior in their life because sin is, is a terrible thing. And e eternal torment is a terrible thing. And we want eternal life. But for many years, churches, specifically churches um, very similar to ours, would be very um, passionate about getting souls saved, but then we would let go and we would not follow through necessarily with the discipleship. We would not follow through with the strengthening and encouraging. We would take these babes in Christ and we would release them out to a very dangerous world, a hostile world. And obviously we know that um, a, a babe in Christ is going to be very vulnerable to a lot of different things. And, you know, we have, we have young children, uh, Micah and Nora. Nora is very young, but Micah is also young as well. And we're not going to just turn them loose into a world that's very dangerous. We're going to try to train them. We're going to try to teach them. We're going to try to protect them. And that's the same thing that we need to do with babes in Christ. And that is what Paul and Barnabas did. They decided to go back because they thought that these people needed more strengthening. They needed more discipleship. And so we need to have a passion for making disciples, not just a passion for souls. Yes, that's great. But we need to have a passion for discipleship as well, to follow up the salvations that we see in our church. How many times have we seen someone come and they've, they've made a decision for Christ at some kind of special meeting that we never see them again? The problem is, is there's a, a lot of times we miss out on the discipleship portion of the Great Commission. So, how many Christians need strengthening in their souls? All Christians need strengthening in their souls. Even... Christians who have been saved for many, many years need some encouragement. And so when we look at these young Christians that Paul and Barnabas dealt with here, there's no doubt in our minds that they need somebody to come back and give them some more teaching and to give them some more guidance and to give them some more discipleship. And so that's something as we move forward as a church and anybody who's watching here today that's a believer, possibly you even might go to another church. Uh, maybe you're not in this area and you, you have another home church. We need to be very vigilant in our churches today about discipleship. And so they were more concerned um, about the complete spiritual health of these individuals and not just a part of it. So Christians do need strengthening in their souls. How many of us need exhorting? How many of us need to have encouragement in continuing with our faith? You know, it's no small thing to walk with the Lord. There's a lot of difficulties um, day by day, year by year, trial by trial. It takes a strong soul to have an encouraged faith. And a lot of people, even though we have salvation in Jesus Christ, we allow ourselves to weaken. We allow ourselves to break down because instead of encouraging others, instead of being encouraged by others in the edification process, 
We allow ourselves to get on an island. We allow ourselves to get isolated. We try to deal with things on our own. We try to think that we can handle them ourselves instead of relying on the power of God, instead of relying on the edification of other people, uh, other believers. We try to be by ourselves, and that can cause uh, a lot of discouragement. It can lead to a lot of depression, spiritual doubt, and we have to, as Christians, be vigilant about this. Because we look and we say, well, that babe in Christ, they might have a hard time. They've only been saved for a year. They need help. But you could also have a Christian in your church that has 50 years of salvation under their belt, but there is a time in their life in which they're feeling depressed, they're feeling down, and they need that encouragement. And so we need to understand that we're in this together as the body of believers, ultimately lifting up Jesus Christ and exalting him. Not that he needs our help. Not that he needs us, but he has a desire for us to have that personal walk with him. And that's exactly the amazing blessing of Christianity. It's not this religion that we have to uphold. We don't have to have all of our obligations. We don't have to keep all the sacraments. And then God looks down and says, well, because you've done all these things, now you're blessed. No, instead, God says, I've done all this for you, knowing that you're still going to fail me. And though you should be loving me, that is not the stipulation of God's love for us. Because we know that God loved us first. And we understand that he's done these things for us in his grace and his mercy and his patience for us. And so that's part of the teaching process. So what happens here is that we see Paul and Barnabas coming to strengthen these Christians and to exhort these Christians. Now, how do they do that? Well, they did it by bringing a very simple message born out of Paul's personal experiences. And what is that? Well, we see it there in verse number 22. It says, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith. And here is what Paul's saying. Here's my, here's Paul's experience. And he's saying, this is what you're going to experience. And that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. So Paul is coming with a message that isn't necessarily a feel good message, but Paul's coming with a message that those Christians needed to hear. And he's coming with a message that all Christians need to hear. So what does he say here? He says that we must live our Christian life expecting trials, expecting tribulations. And as we move along in our life, there's going to be tribulations. And Paul could preach this message because he's lived this message. And I want you to see point number one here this morning, that in the midst of opposition, Paul took time to care for the spiritual well-being of others. Instead of always focusing on himself, Instead of only focusing on the people that were very close to him, Paul, even though he was being opposed by a lot of different things, he was being opposed by um, the government, he was being opposed by the people, he was being opposed by his own physical health. There was all these things that were coming against Paul. But in the midst of all of these um, tribulations and trials that were coming his way, his focus was on the spiritual well-being of others. And we see it there in verse number 22. He's confirming the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith. Well, what does that mean? Well, his goals are given here, but what what does it mean to confirm them? What does it mean to exhort them? Well, we understand that confirming the souls of the disciples means that he came to give them more strength. That word um, confirm in the original language means to come and strengthen more. So there was already strength with these disciples because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But what Paul was coming to do was to fortify their doctrines, to fortify um, their beliefs and their organization and all these different things that we're going to talk about here in a few moments. So he comes to do this in the confirming of these disciples, but also we see that word exhorting. So he comes confirming the souls of the disciples, and then he comes exhorting them to continue in the faith. What does that word exhorting mean? It means to teach. It means to come alongside of. It means to encourage. So not only is Paul coming down with a message and raining that message upon them, but he's coming alongside of them to encourage them, to be that example for them. And we know that Paul even does that in Scripture. He says, I'm, you know, look at me as an example of how I follow Christ and how you should follow Christ. And so he's coming alongside training these people. And so he comes confirming, which means to strengthen more. And he comes exhorting, to teach, to come alongside of, to encourage. And so what is his message in doing this? His message is this. Continue in the faith. But realize as you are continuing in the faith that you are going to go through much tribulation before you enter the kingdom of God. That's what he's saying here in this verse. Now, is he telling them this to scare them? 
Well, we're going to talk about that here in a few moments. But what is he doing? He, he's, he's coming to give them this message. And he's saying, don't be discouraged when trials happen. Instead, we should be encouraged in the Lord. And then through that, we should be encouraging others. Paul made it very clear that it was not an easy thing that they would have to do. They would expect trials. There would be suffering. Um, but before that they would see the Lord in glory, these things would have to happen. And we would say, well, that's a scary message. That, that's a message in which would probably scare a lot of people away. Well, Paul wasn't worried about scaring people. Paul was worried about telling the truth. And so these truths were not given to frighten people, to scare people. These truths were actually given to strengthen them in their faith, to give them confidence in the Lord, to give them confirmation that they're doing the right thing. Because what Paul's saying is, hey, look, I'm trying to do the right thing for the Lord. I'm facing opposition. If you face the uh, opposition, that might mean that you're doing the right things for the Lord. Now, let me give you a little side note here. There's a lot of Christians who try to stir the pot. There's a lot of Christians who want to play the martyr. So they do things which are not biblical to get people to look at them, to persecute them even more. And they go above and beyond what the Bible says so that people will persecute them even more and they look for trouble. Folks, we don't need to be looking for trouble because we'll face, we'll face enough trials just by trying to live a godly Christian life, a, a life focused on serving the Lord, a life focused on the gospel of Jesus. We don't need to go looking for trouble because trouble is going to come our way. And, and, and that's the truth of the matter. But as a, a Christian, an, an early Christian, Paul is facing um, a lot of obstacles and he's teaching them that this is going to be that way all the way till the end of time, basically. And so in the face of trials, in the midst of trials, Paul is concerned with the spiritual health of other people. And that should be the same for us, even in this difficult time. As much as we want to speculate on what's going on, as much as we want to have different theories of what's going on, and you know the, the validity of the things that are coming down from the government or the validity of this virus, hey, it doesn't really matter. The truth is, is that we're in a difficult time right now. And instead of only focusing on self, hey, I want you to focus on your spiritual life. That's very, very important. But part of the spiritual growth process, part of the process in which we are being uh, more and more like Christ each and every day, is the mindset of not only am I looking out for self, but I'm looking out for others in their spiritual walk. Now, you might not have things to help people. You might not have a ton of money. You might not have a house that you can put up a bunch of people in. But what you can do is you can spiritually um, encourage other people. You can teach other people. And Paul, with having really not a lot of his fingertips, was influencing other people for the Lord because his focus was the spiritual well-being of these people in the midst of trials. So I want you to remember that. In the midst of your trials of life, in the midst of your difficulties, in the midst of your obstacles, don't forget about how you are called to influence others for the Lord, to influence others in their spiritual walk. But I want you to see in verse number 23 the work of Paul and Barnabas here on the way home. Paul and Barnabas were committed not just to making new Christians, but establishing new churches. And, and these churches were the, the places, the epicenters of where Christians would grow and they would establish um, these different fellowships in the Lord. So in the midst of opposition, yes, Paul and Barnabas were focused on the spiritual health of these people. But then I want you to see number two. In the midst of opposition, they sought to do things decently and in order according to God's plan. See it there in verse number 23 with me in Acts chapter 14. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. So what is it saying here? What, what is this trying to tell us? Well, it would have been very tempting for Paul and Barnabas to go through these cities and give the gospel. See folks saved. Even though there's opposition, they see folks saved. They minister to them and then they say, okay, we're going. Um, it would have been very easy for them to say that. It would have been very easy to say, well, we preach to you. Um, we've taught you. Now have a great day. See you later. Um, we're going on to the next city. It would have been very easy for them to do that. But instead, they took the time to organize the church. They took the time to organize the different aspects of the church so that more people could come to know the Lord and there could be a, a, a place where um, growth could be cultivated in, um, in the churches. Now, what do I mean by this? I mean this. Obviously, God has ordained the church, the local assembly. And he does it in a way in which um, is organized. Is, and this, things are done decently and in order, as the Bible says. And so Paul and Barnabas were not necessarily just worried about souls being saved. They weren't just worried about, well, let's teach them. Because there weren't a lot of other churches at this time period. There really were no churches in these areas. 
And so what Paul and Barnabas were doing is they were training these people and then they were organizing these people. A lot of people think, well, churches don't need to be organized. They can just be ragtag. They can just do whatever they want to do. Folks, I think it's very important for us to look at scripture and to see exactly how God has ordained the church so that we can follow it in an organized and decent manner. So they took time. Paul took time to organize these churches. Even though they were young in the faith, they needed some leadership. And they needed to have godly leaders that were um, following the qualifications of Scripture that would lead and administrate and organize. And so Paul and Barnabas do just that. They organize these elders or these pastors, and they set up all of the churches in these areas. Paul and Barnabas knew that these churches must have proper administration so that they could appoint elders and um, in every city that there were Christians. And so as this went along, they knew that, well, there's going to be persecution. There's going to be people that come against them. So they need to be organized. And so they faced it with this mindset of biblical leadership. And we need to understand that there's importance to biblical leadership. You know, a lot of people say, well, I can just, I can just, um, you know, we're, we're all Christians. Let's just meet together. Let's just all stand up and we can yell out what we believe about God. Folks, there's, there is precedent in scripture. There's commands in scripture for there to be organized leadership within churches. And, and I think that's important for us to remember and so many times we've allowed our mindset of government, uh, our personal mindset of government to leak into what churches should be. But I think we need to go back and we need to look specifically about what the, the Bible says about what church administration should be like. And again, this isn't really the main point of the message. And I think that's a, that's a study for another time. But I think we need to realize that it is a good thing for churches and, and, and fellowships and assemblies, as the Bible called it back at that time period, local assemblies, to be organized. And, and we see that it was one of the priorities of Paul and Barnabas as they left. And so we see the priority, the first and foremost priority was the gospel. Then it was discipleship. And then it was organization. And, and we see that happening here. And I think that's an amazing truth for us to follow along as we have churches here in America today. Paul and Barnabas demonstrated their great concern for the health of these churches by their prayer and fasting. So you see that there in verse 23. So after they organized, they said, and they had prayed with fasting. And they commended them to the Lord. So they gave them over to the Lord on whom they believed. So they prayed and they fasted for the spiritual well-being of these churches, for the organization of these churches. But in the end, they can only trust in God's ability to keep these churches healthy. And, they, and we see that by what it says in Scripture. They commended them to the Lord. They gave these churches, they gave these people over to the Lord. Instead of trying to micromanage them, instead of trying to um, you know, run the church like Paul would run it, um, they are, they're organizing it, they're teaching them, and then they commend them to the Lord. They give them to the Lord. And I think that's something that we need to see is that obviously we can pray for our church. We can fast. We can do all of these things. We can serve. But ultimately, we have to realize that the power of the church, the power of God's word, the success of the church, the protection of the church is in the hands of the Lord. And if we get that confused, if we get our priorities mixed up, we can start, in essence, doubting the sovereignty of God, doubting the power of God, doubting his control in our lives. And so we see that Paul and Barnabas, yes, they prayed and they fasted, but they gave it over to the Lord. And the question here today is, you know, how often are we concerned with the spiritual health of our church? How often are we concerned with all these things of the church, the spiritual um, guidance of the administration and all these different things. And we need to be praying for our church. We need, to be, we need to be on our knees on a daily basis praying for the effectiveness of our church and the community that we live in. But, like we said before, ultimately, like Paul and Barnabas did, we need to give our church over to God. We need to allow God to do the work. And it says in the last part of verse 23, on whom they believed. So we see that connection between belief and faith and allowing God to take control. If we really believe that God is in control, we won't hoard all the things. We won't worry. We won't stress. Now, there will be some concern, okay? But we understand that when we stress and we worry and we have anxiety, we're allowing God, really, in essence, to kind of be removed out of the equation and we put it on upon ourselves. Now, of course, there is some personal responsibility that we're to take in the guidance of God. But when we start doubting who God is, is when we start seeing a lot of people question whether or not things can get done. But Paul and Barnabas said, look, we're going we're gonna to organize the church. 
We're going to pray, we're going to fast, and then we're going to give it over to God because we believe. And that's an amazing truth that we see. In the end, we trust only in God's ability to keep our churches healthy. Um, we, we trust in God because we believe in him. And Paul and Barnabas did that as an example, and we need to follow along here. So, number one, in the midst of trials, we should have a focus on others' spiritual well-being. Number two, in the midst of trials, we should be focused on doing things decently and in order. It would be very easy in a trial in our life to let go of some things that we um, should be doing. Um, not worrying about, well, this and that. Well, you know, what we should be doing is focus on what God has for us and doing things decently and in order. So I want you to see those two things. And then number three, I want you to see in the midst of opposition, these individuals stay faithful to the Lord. Let's catch it here in verse number 24. And after they had passed through uh, throughout Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia. And we see them then moving on. And when they had preached the word in Perga, they went to Italia, uh, Italia and thence sailed to Antioch, from whence they had been recommended to the grace of God for the work which they fulfilled. And so we see these individuals being faithful for the Lord. We see them come full circle. They return to the place in which they were called to do the work. They, call, they were called in Antioch, Assyria, to do the work, and now they're returning in faithfulness to the Lord. Some of the most amazing words of the Bible are found here in verse number 26. And I want you to see it at the end. It says, And thence sail to Antioch. They're coming back to that original city. From whence they had been recommended to the grace of God for the work which they had fulfilled. That's beautiful. What is, what is that really saying in everyday English? It's saying they're coming back home to the place that they were called by God and to where they dedicated their lives to God with a work that was completed. And I think that's all of our prayer requests. I mean, all of us want to know that the task that we've been given, we've stayed faithful to it. And these individuals in the face of trials were faithful to the Lord and the Lord was faithful to them. And so... They trusted in God's grace to fulfill that work, and he continued in his grace to the end. Now, obviously, this isn't the end of the story. This is just the end of this portion of the story. Now, there's more missionary journeys that are to come. But this immediate call that God gave to them, they uh, fulfilled. They stayed faithful to it. So, ultimately, the work is not done yet. And we all know that our work is not done until we breathe our last breath or the Lord returns. But our immediate goals can be reached. And a lot of people think, well, you know, we shouldn't set goals. Well, you know, the Bible says that as God gives us commands, we should follow them. And those should be our goals. And so we should be faithful to those goals. Their success with evangelism amongst the Gentiles and the blessings of God that were demonstrated in the life of Paul and Barnabas showed that the work which had been done in Antioch was not unique. Um, so a lot of people sometimes think, well, the, work, the Lord is only working here. But it was a reminder for Paul and Barnabas that God was working all over the world. God wanted to replicate this work um, all over the different areas of that world at that time. And God's still doing that today. We can't forget that God is still working around the world. Sometimes we think, well, he's just working here in America. Or he's just working here in Delaware. And we get so narrow-minded. When I was a little kid, I thought my church was the only church that was doing the work of God. Because I was so narrow-minded. You know, when you're a child, you don't see the bigger picture. And as I got older, I started realizing, whoa, there's churches in our area that preach the gospel. There's churches in our state. There's churches in our country. There's churches around the world. And that's an amazing reminder for us that God is still at work. And God is going to continue his work. And if we want to be part of that, we need to jump on board. And we see Paul and Barnabas here realizing that God is not just working in, in Antioch of Syria. God is working all over the world. And God is not just here working in the hearts of the people of Middletown Baptist Church. God is working in the hearts of the people that are on the mission field. God's working in the hearts of the people that aren't coming to church. And you say, what in the world is that? Well, there could be somebody who had a seed planted 20 years ago by someone going door to door. And maybe they need to see a Facebook video. Maybe they need to drive by and see a sign. And you don't know what God is doing with the people across our area and across the world. And that means for us to be busy about what God has called us to do. That is that gospel message. God opens the door for these guys, Paul and Barnabas. We have to remember that every spiritual victory, every soul that is saved, every obstacle that is defeated, comes from the power of God. And the same power of God that was giving Paul 
the strength to overcome obstacles. The same power of God that was giving Paul the ability to preach God's word and to see souls saved is the same God that's working today. And, and, and we have to realize that God is still in control and that God is powerful. And so, back in their home church in Syria of Antioch, what do they do? Well, they can, they can assume that Paul and Barnabas took a long break and found plenty of ministry um, to do back there. Where, where do we see that? Well, we see that there at the end. It says, and there they abode a long time with the disciples. Verse 27 says that they gave an update of all of their things. So, so there was importance of their testimony. There was an importance of them telling the other people of what, what God has done. And it showed their faithfulness, and that faithfulness uh, probably spread there in that church in Antioch. And then it said they stayed there for a while. They abode there a long time with the disciples. And so they were faithful, yes, but there was a time in which God had called them to stay still. And no doubt, in my mind, that Paul and Barnabas stayed busy in that church in Antioch. They didn't just sit down and say, well, we're going to take a sabbatical. We're just going to sit and sip our you know, uh, drinks there by the water. No, I think Paul and Barnabas were busy in that, in that church in Antioch until they were called to the next step of their missionary journeys. And we're going to see next week that the story's not over for Paul and Barnabas. They get back and some religious leaders are going to start questioning um, what the gospel message really means. So, number three, in the midst of opposition, they stayed faithful to the Lord. And lastly, I want you to see this, and then we'll be done. In the midst of opposition, they were prepared for the work of God. Like I said before, they weren't just sitting around, waiting, not doing anything. They were staying faithful. They were preparing themselves. They were studying God's word. They were ministering. The trip was a, uh, was a great success. And a lot of times in our Christian walk, sometimes off of the heels of success, we can kind of get um, relaxed. We come off of a great revival, or we come off of a great junior camp, or we come off of a great um, sermon, and we're like, wow, this is great. And the tendency is to say, we've done a lot for God, now we can kind of take a break. And they did not do that. Uh, the trip was a success, though there were a lot of great obstacles in their life. The difficulty of travel, the confrontation of the sorcerer there in Cyprus, um, the quitting of John Mark, if you remember that, one of one of the uh, loyal subjects, the loyal disciples of, of Paul and of God um, left them. He went back home, so that was difficult for them. They had been driven out of the cities of Antioch. They had been driven out of the cities of Iconium. Um, there was a temptation to receive the praise from those people that were saved. Um, they had been stoned in Lystra. So the, the list was long of the things that they overcame. But Paul and Barnabas, through this, would not be deterred from the work that God had for them. And so the question here today is this. What will it take for you to back down from the will of God? Or the question can be posed in a positive nature. What will it take for you to stay consistent and faithful to what God's call for you in your life is? What kind of temptation or obstacle or opposition will hinder us? I hope nothing. I hope, I hope you say, well, nothing will stop me. But many times, by the way that we live our life, our testimony speaks louder than what we say. Can we have the heart of Paul and Barnabas to, to not allow anything to stop us? Uh, I hope so. Nothing stopped Jesus from doing God's will on our behalf. And as we look at him, we have the power to overcome any obstacle in our lives. We have the power to overcome any difficulty in our lives. But so many times when we are pressed with some pain, when we're pressed with some opposition, we back down. And so the question here this morning is, are we willing to continue moving forward? Are we continuing the gospel of Jesus Christ? I would love to tell you that the story ends here for Paul and Barnabas. I would love to tell you that they went on living in Antioch and retired and continue to see all these blessings and everybody in the world agreed with them. But we know that the story does not end here. We know that... Acts chapter 15 tells us that there are some folks in Jerusalem that were saying that there are things that they needed to add on to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so Paul and Barnabas are going to have to say, okay, they have to pick up their mantle. They have to pick up, you know, put on, roll up their sleeves and say, let's go down and start defending the Lord. And that's sometimes how it feels like in the Christian walk. We want to just relax. We want to just get to a point of coasting. But the Bible says that that's never going to come. There's going to be times of blessing. There's going to be times of peace. But ultimately, we know that full satisfaction and full peace 
and, and, and full comfort comes when we reach our everlasting home, when we reach the eternal place, the eternal destination of heaven. And so the proper mindset comes by reading Philippians 4, chapter 3, verse number 14. And actually, you could go back two more verses. And this is where we're going to end today. And obviously, you know who wrote this passage of Scripture. This is Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And you have to remember what's happening to Paul when he's in um, writing in Philippians. What is he doing? Well, Paul is in jail. He, he's in a Roman prison for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. But he gives us some instructions. He gives us his proper perspective here in Philippians chapter 3. And I can't help but think that when Paul was writing this, he was thinking about that stoning in Lystra. He was thinking about all the things that happened on this first missionary journey. So we see it in verse number 12. He says, Not as though I had already attained. Either were already perfect. But I follow after, if that I may apprehend that, for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Now there's some interesting wording there, but essentially what he's saying is, I don't see myself as reaching my final destination here on this earth. Paul says, I don't perceive that my job is done. He says, I don't sit back and just relax. Verse number 13, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Now, that's interesting. What does he say there? He says, well, I, I don't see myself as getting the goal yet, but this one thing I do, I forget those things which are behind me, and I press on to those things which are before me. You say, what, is, what are those things he's saying about forgetting about? Well, a lot of times this verse is talked about, well, forgetting all the bad things that I've done in my past and, and looking for it. And that's certainly a, an interpretation. That's certainly, I think, one of the ways that we can see this. is forgetting all the wrongs that we've done in the past and looking to the, doing the good for the Lord. But I also believe that this lumps into doing the things that we've done in the past for the Lord. You know, a lot of people want to look back and say, look at all the things that we used to do for God. Look at all those things. Paul could have said, well, look back to Lystra when I was stoned and I got up and I walked away. That was great. And he could have lived in the glory of Lystra. He could have looked back and he says, man, remember Paul and Barnabas? Remember us? You know, we were great. We were back in Antioch and we were called by God. We went around that first missionary tour. There was so much going on. So many people were against us and we made it back to Antioch, man. That was great. And there's no doubt in my mind he, he referenced those opportunities and he gave that testimony. But what he's saying here is I don't live in my past victories. I don't live in my past failures. I do this. He says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He, think, he looks at those things which are before. He presses towards that mark of Jesus Christ and he pushes forward. And that was the example of Paul. We're going to go through more stories in the book of Acts where Paul went through some pretty incredible things. And Paul could have bragged. And Paul, even Paul does say that later on. He says, if anybody has a reason to brag, it's me. But he says, no, I can't, because I'm pressing on for Jesus Christ. I'm not looking back at my past. Now, we can look at our past and say, man, praise the Lord for those things that he did. But if we stay there, and we don't move on to what God has for us today, if, if we don't move on to what God has for us next week, next year, then we're missing out on the blessings that God has for us in the future, and we're missing out on the opportunities to minister. So a lot of people might say, well, what does that mean for us as Christians today? That means if you're a believer today, and you've, you've trusted in the Lord, and you understand what that call is for your life, what are you doing to move forward in that call? What are you doing to better yourself in your Christian walk? What are you doing to extend your gospel reach in your sphere of influence? Well, you might say, well, I go to church. Well, that's great. Church is a place for you to find your ministry. Church is a place for you to serve. But remember, the church is so much bigger than just the activities. The church is so much bigger than just the building. The church is the body of Christ and our influence in our community. Church can happen on Monday. Church can happen on Friday. Church can happen at the ball field. Church can happen, uh, you know, anywhere. You might say, what are you saying? We're not supposed to assemble? No, we're supposed to assemble. 
And I'm longing for the day in which we can be back together. And I know that that's coming soon. And we've got more announcements about that coming. But what I'm trying to tell you is that your individual gospel outreach can be done anywhere. anywhere. And so I encourage you to do that. To inspect your life. To say, have I allowed something in my life, whether it be small or whether it even be a great trial, to hinder my walk with the Lord, to hinder my daily devotions, to hinder my prayer life, to hinder my witness, to hinder my spiritual concern for other people and their spiritual walk. Because what happens sometimes is when we're hurt, we, we go into our shell. Mike has got a pet turtle. And when we go, you know, because I go to grab the turtle sometimes because that's just what I like to do. And I, I, when I grab the turtle, it goes into a shell, right? And so many Christians are kind of like that. We're, we're big and, and bad, and we, walk, we talk to talk, we walk to walk until that big hand comes at us, that trial comes, and we go in our shell. And there's nothing wrong with being an introvert, and there's nothing wrong with being an extrovert. But the Bible calls us to be bold about our witness in the way that God has called us to be. So that's for Christians today. But there could be someone watching this video that doesn't even understand the gospel truth. What is the gospel? The gospel is the good news. And I want to give you the gospel message in a very brief way right now. The gospel message is that Jesus Christ was a real person. And not only was he a real person, but he was the Son of God, the only begotten of God. He was 100% God, 100% man. He came to this earth to be made flesh for us. And as he lived a perfect life, he was persecuted. Um, he, he fulfilled the law. And he was put on a cross. And they, they killed him, yes, but he gave himself for us as the perfect sacrifice. And that perfect sacrifice is why we can have salvation in him. It's not in our good works. It's in the fact that we've trusted in the righteous sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the substitutionary death. And that's what we always celebrate. And so what many people tell you is you've got to live a good life. Well, I'm a good Baptist. You know, I'm a good Christian. Well, really, truthfully speaking, no one's a good Christian. You, might, you say, what? Guys, we're, we're all failures because we can't keep the law. We cannot keep the law. We can try, but we can't keep the law. So what saves us? Faith in Jesus Christ saves us. Faith in the one who is righteous saves us. And it's by grace that we're saved, not of works that we do. Because if it was of works that we do, we could boast. And so Romans 3.23 tells us that all sin to come short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. That's physical death, yes, but also spiritual death. And because of our sin, we are, we are guilty. And because of our guilty uh, nature, we now have to have a penalty. And that penalty is called hell. It's eternal punishment, separation from God. And we think, well, the story's kind of sad there. But the end of um, Romans 6.23 says, But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So the gift is the fact that we can trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior and that we can ever, have everlasting life in Him and that we can spend eternity in a place called heaven. And so you say, well, I want, I want that. I desire that. I, I want to know what it means to not be relying on self, but rely on God and have true biblical salvation. Well, you say, what do I do? Do I have to sign up for your church? Do I have to say a prayer? Well, what it says in the Bible is that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you repent of your old ways. doesn't mean you're going to be perfect, but what it means is that you turn away from sin and you turn away from yourself to save you and you turn to God to save you. If you do that and you trust in him and you call out to him, he will save you. And so the truth is this morning is that you don't have to jump through hoops. You don't have to become a perfect person. You don't have to get cleaned up because the job of the Holy Spirit is to clean you up at salvation. And so a lot of people get that flip. They say, I have to get this all right, then I'll come to God. No, come to God and he'll clean you up. He'll change your life. And the Bible says that you'll be a new creation in him. And so if that's something that you want to do here this morning, I ask that you just call out to him. And I don't want you to repeat the words that I say because the words that I say are not your words. But essentially what you can do is you can call out to him and say, I, I, I need you, Lord. I know that I can't save myself. I want you to save me. I believe in the death of Jesus Christ and his resurrection because he didn't stay dead. He conquered death. And because he conquered death, I can have victory in Jesus. And that's what true victory is. True victory is not winning a court case. True victory is not me getting a bunch of money. True victory is me not winning the Super Bowl. True victory is having the hope in Jesus Christ. And so this morning you can call out to him after I'm done praying or you can even do it right now. 
you could call out to God and trust in him today as your personal savior. I'm going to go ahead and close our service here with a word of prayer. And as I'm praying, I'm asking you to reflect on your life. Christian, today, what are you doing for him? What are you doing in the face of obstacles? Are you living with your eyes focused on the obstacles instead of focused on him? If that's the case, turn your eyes back to him. But if you're watching here today and you need Jesus Christ as your Savior, you might be even a church member. But if you realize that you haven't trusted in Jesus as your Savior, I pray that you do that now. As I pray, I want you to unite your hearts together with me in a time of reflection for the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we're thankful for this time that you've given us. We're thankful for decisions that were made, decisions that are being made right now. Lord, we're thankful that you've given us the example in Scripture to see how we can overcome these obstacles in our life. And Lord, we know that all of these obstacles are nothing in the presence of our King, Lord, in the presence of, of, of our God. Lord, we know that you are amazing. We know that you're powerful. We know that you're in control. And Lord, I pray that you can give us peace and comfort in this time. But I pray if there's someone right now who's even calling out to you, Lord, I pray that you give them clarity and understanding, Lord. I pray that they can receive you as their Savior and they can have the courage to reach out to a local church, um, reach out to our church, and Lord, that they can get more information on how they can be discipled. So Lord, I pray that you continue to bless in the service. We're thankful for all those individuals who watched here today. We're thankful for uh, the opportunity to worship you. And we pray that you continually uh, bless us here this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, amen. If you made a decision for the Lord, or you decided um, to um, maybe move along in your spiritual walk, or you want to know what it means to be more involved in the church, or join a church, or anything like that, we ask that you, um, there's going to be something that comes up on the screen here right now, and we ask that you uh, fill out that information on our website, middletownbaptistchurch.org. At the bottom of the page, there's a, a place where you can write a message. We want you to write a message to us. Or you can even email me if you need prayer. If you need something to talk about, um, you need some counsel and some things. Now, of course, I, I don't know that I have all the answers for you. But we do know who has all the answers, and we know who the Savior of the world is, and we know that His Word is true, and that it's holy, and that it's perfect. And so if there's any way that you'd like to communicate with us about that, if you have questions, we'd love to um, correspond with you, and we'd love for you to send those in. So please, if you made a decision for the Lord today, don't feel ashamed. Um, instead, feel confident in your Savior. Reach out to us because we have information that can help you even more in your growth in the Lord. There's things that we can send you. There's things that we can lead you to that, can, that, we, that you can see um, the great way that can, God can work in your life and that you can continue on here in the growth process. Well, thank you so much for watching today. I hope that your hearts were encouraged through this message and challenged through this message. And I pray that as a church and as individuals that we can grow closer uh, to the Lord uh, through our services here. Now, normally this would be the time where we pass around our offering plates, and <clears throat> that's going to be probably something of the past um, because of all of these different viruses. Until we get back to normal, we probably won't be ever passing plates. Um, there will be alternate ways to do that. But we also have alternate ways to do it right now. You can obviously still mail your giving into our church, um, and also you can go online to middletownbaptistchurch.org on the Give Online tab, and many of you are um, using this tool, and it's a safe and secure way in which you can give to the Lord. And, and a lot of people that might not know what this is all about, you might say, well, well what are we giving to? Are we just giving to your salary, or are we, are we just giving to so that you can buy a new car? This, this money is given to the church, and it's used uh, for the furtherance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, there, and there's many ways in which that is done, but we understand that um, what you give to the Lord is not so that you can get the pastor's attention, so that you can do all these things and get you know a, a button on your shirt that says I'm a you know a two-time donor or a five-time donor. This is all between you and the Lord, and God commands us to stay faithful in our giving, to be cheerful in our giving, um, and to support um, our local churches and also missions. And so there's many ways that you can get involved giving at our church, but two of the major ways is just through the regular general fund and also through our missions department. We support 26 missionaries around the country or around the country, around the world, excuse me, somewhere in our country and somewhere around the world. And when you do that, um, it goes directly to them if you give towards missions. And there's a tab that you can give towards that. Well, thank you so much for being such a supportive group. Thank you so much for watching today. And uh, we want to let you know that we're doing a lot of things, um, a lot of plans in the church. Some people have asked me recently, when are we, when are we meeting again? Um, that's an answer I can't give you exactly, but I can tell you that we're getting closer. Many of you saw the press conference about uh, opening up phase one in June, um, June 1st. 
And there are some things that were given along with that and some guidelines. And we're working um, towards opening up there in early part of June. I do know that Governor Carney here in Delaware is having another press conference tomorrow and he's going to be talking more about religious organizations. And so that will apply to us in the way that we come back and meet in person. And so we'll have more information after tomorrow. So we just ask that you stay tuned. We ask that you stay um, patient with us as we're um, thinking of plans and um, coming up with ideas on how to meet back again. And you're going to find people on both sides of the argument here. And what we're trying to do as a church is we're trying to coincide all these things um, to have your safety in mind, to have your spiritual well-being in mind. And so we're doing our best um, as a church. And so I ask that you stay faithful with me. If you, if you question that, that's okay. Um, it, it's, you know, you're free to do that. But we just ask that um, we have church unity in all of this and we stay faithful to what God has called us to do. We will still continue to do many things online so that it's a gradual shift. And we will still continue to do things online even when we come back in person. But we just ask that you stay faithful to checking out our Facebook page, our YouTube channel, our website. And here's all the places in which you can get information. So check out tomorrow. We're going to post a graphic on our Facebook page that will give you the schedule of things. Um, we have our Monday devotion in the evenings. We have our Tuesday morning devotion, Coffee with the Pastor, live at 10. Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. We have our Wednesday um, prayer time and uh, Bible study. Thursday is our Kids Day. Um, Friday we do a time of updates and announcements and also question and answer time. So many Bible studies throughout the week. We've tried to count them up. I think there's six to seven Bible studies throughout the week. So we're trying to give you as many opportunities as a church to stay tuned to God's word. Um, but again, there's also the encouragement to do things on your own, to, to, Bible, to do Bible studies, um, to pray, um, to, to grow in your walk, to encourage others. And many of you are doing such a great job with encouraging the church, encouraging um, me, encouraging the staff, and uh, keep it up. Uh, keep doing it for the Lord. And we're going to see great things happen here at Middletown Baptist Church. Be looking for a few announcements this week. Um, we're going to be announcing some, some interesting things that are coming up, but I don't want to give you too much here today in the service. So just be watching our Facebook page. There's going to be uh, a few announcements coming this week, and you'll see that. And uh, you can share those announcements as we come along for some activities that we're having coming up. So be in prayer for our church. Be in prayer for our country. Be in prayer for our world. Be in prayer for our medical professionals, um, the politicians, the government officials that are making decisions. We want to be supportive. We want to be a great testimony. We want to be salt and light. We want to make our impact on the world, not just in the good times, but in the difficult times. So here's our opportunity to be the church here today. So I pray that you do that. I pray that you stay faithful tonight at 6 p.m. We are having our study in Ruth. We're going to continue that in our Bible study. So I encourage you to be back here on Facebook Live. Also, we do a Bible study um, for adults before our Sunday morning service. This morning, um, the program that we used, there were some uh, hindrances and sort of some maybe some problems with their um, technology. So I'll give you more information about that if you're interested in that Bible study. And also we do a virtual lobby after the service today. Well, that virtual lobby uses the same technology. So we're going to try to get on there and sign on, but if it doesn't work, we'll just try it next week. So of course, technology is a blessing and a curse sometimes. And, uh, but we're thankful for this Facebook live that we can do. And we're thankful for all the other venues. So again, thank you so much. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Uh, we are thankful that the Lord is doing great things here at Middletown Baptist Church. We're praying for you. Um, we love you. And uh, most importantly, God loves you. And we want you to know if you need anything, you let us know. And we're continuing to uh, stand together in the Lord. So I hope you have a great day. We'll see you back tonight at 6 p.m. for our study in Ruth. God bless. Take care. Have a great day.